Welcome back in Alive Now. I'm Austin Westfall. Let's get the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. And for that, we turn to retired Marine Intelligence Officer and National Security Analyst Hal Kempfer. As always, Hal, good to see you. Let's get straight into the news. I found this interesting. The proportion of Palestinian women and children being killed in the Israel-Hamas war appears to have declined sharply, according to an Associated Press analysis of Gaza Health Ministry data that they found. They say that this is a trend that both coincides with Israel's changing battlefield tactics and also contradicts the ministry's own public statements. A couple questions on this, Hal. First, this touches on something that you and I discussed just yesterday. Not to say that everything that comes from the health ministry is completely inaccurate. There's no question that a horrifying amount of innocent people have died or have been displaced in Gaza. But the health ministry is run by Hamas, so they do have a dog in this fight, don't they, Hal? Austin, they absolutely do. And, they're, you know, one could say if uh, if you were to step back from the, the horrors of war, if you will, they have a conflict of interest that, uh, they, you know, they're, they're a mouthpiece for Hamas. Uh, of course, every strike, it was almost as if it was written on the wall, the percentage that they would claim that were women and children that were casualties. And, of course, uh, it was very unlikely that uh, that the targeting was at haphazard that it would cause those casualties. But then there were numerous instances where it was just glaringly clear that they had uh, grossly exaggerated the total number of people killed and, of course, the composition. This strike right now that's causing uh, phenomenal controversy, which was a strike on a uh, UN-supported school, and, and under international law, under the laws of war, uh, a school is a protected site. It's not supposed to be targeted. However, under the laws of war, if any protected site is being used for military purposes, then it loses its protected status. Well, in this case, they immediately came out and, and yesterday they were saying that women and children have been killed. There was absolutely no evidence that we're showing that. Uh, today, there's still no evidence, last I checked, uh, showing that women and children were killed. They have not shown uh, the bodies, they, keep them, they kept them shrouded. Uh, and, and the IDF itself says they've seen absolutely no evidence that there was um, any, any women or children killed. So in that case, they've been pretty much caught flat-footed on this one. I mean, it's certainly no one wants to see Israel targeting a, a protected site like a school anymore. They want to see them targeting a hospital or something like that. But Israel was very clear. They said, look, this was a very precise targeted strike. It was a Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad cell, a group that was there for using it for military purposes. And that's what they hit it for. And so far, there's nothing that disputes uh, Israel's account of, of why they did it or, or what the, the consequences or what the results were of that strike. Yet, yet the Ministry of Health puts out information that's been, you know, based, uh, let's just say very misleading if not in some some way, shape, or form fabricated. Is there such thing as a reliable source when it comes to reporting the casualties of this war? That's been, you know, you're asking a, a really good question, and this war's into its eighth, eighth month. There has, uh, and, and I kind of put this on the, the Israelis to say, you know, you can't just, you can't just say their numbers are false if you can't put out other numbers. Now, uh, recognizing within the, uh, the, the challenges of this type of war fighting, there is no way to independently, uh, certainly for Israel to go in there and count up the casualties because, well, their striking areas are controlled by Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So in many cases, these strikes are not, they're not hitting areas obviously controlled by Israeli forces or hitting areas that are not controlled by Israeli forces. And so the only people on the ground that can provide a count are those who are there and those who are there uh, in in many cases are the very same same people who are being targeted by the Israel. So what they do is they create a narrative that they want the world to hear. What really has frustrated many, uh, certainly frustrated Israel, but also frustrated President Biden has expressed frustration at this, is that uh, this that this narrative, whatever they Hamas, uh, the Moss controlled Ministry of Health puts out gets out there, but also, it was getting picked up uh, in total. Uh, there was no filter or any adjustment by uh, the United Nations. And the United Nations was literally putting out the Ministry of Health numbers 
without any critical review, without any an analytical assessment, without any caveats. They would just take those numbers and put them out as ground truth. Once the UN had put them out, that certainly other countries would pick up those numbers and put it out as ground truth. And you get into a kind of a circular circular uh, pathway there in terms of uh, the information feed, which was, it was, you know, they use the phrase ego in high tech, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If it's bad information going in and it's just picked up and run with, uh, no matter where it comes from, it's still garbage. Uh, it's bad information coming out. So if the AP's findings stand true, how have Israel's tactics changed over the course of this war? And did the change in tactics seem to coincide with international pressure from allies like the U.S.? As you see from the New York Times back in February, we all remember when Biden called the IDF campaign over the top. Uh, you know, one thing I've been watching is uh, the type of strikes and the number of strikes that Israel's been uh, uh, doing in, in the Gaza Strip. Now, a couple of things right off. There's less total strikes in part because there's less places that they need to strike. I mean, they they pretty much, they haven't cleared, but they have taken ground throughout the entire Gaza Strip and they've taken uh, a good chunk of Rafa, which was the last urban area uh, that they had to take. So they control a large chunk of Rafa. They are in downtown Rafa. There isn't that much more of the area that they have to take, although with the uh, underground uh, complex, that tunnel complex, you know, the infamous Gaza Metro, there are, there are shortly so many Hamas fighters that are uh, underground, hidden in tunnels. They can pop up alongside them, behind them, wherever. So it's gonna take a while to clear that, uh, that, that entire area out. That could literally take many months before they have the, all the underground stuff cleared. With all that said, there's less total strikes. And with less total strikes, you can have less damage. With less damage, you're gonna have less collateral damage. That's another way of saying less, less civilians killed. Uh, but on the other hand, I also think that the international pressure has had tremendous effect, particularly the US pressure on Israel uh, to be much more uh, careful in its targeting. Uh, some of that is, you know, they may have a lawful target. I mean, by by international, by the law of war, they may have a target. They go, yep, there's there's a Hamas command and control center. It's right there. We see it. Uh, but there's a decision to be made, which is if we hit this, there's an area not too far away where there's some civilians, and we could have collateral damage to civilians. Well, that's a decision that they make. Is a, you know, is the target worth uh, uh, you know uh, uh, prosecuting? Is it worth going after that target? in light of the collateral damage or potential collateral damage you're looking at. I think in those discussions, the U.S. pressure, the international pressure has had an influence on whether it's worth taking out that particular Hamas target compared to the collateral damage. And that's just, it's anecdotal because I can't say that's what's happening. It just seems that way when you look at it on, on what they're doing, that that's having some influence in, in terms of their choice of targeting in terms of how they target as well. They might use a different weapon system to go after it, uh, a different way of attacking it, one that might scope in or limit the amount of potential collateral damage. Whereas in the early days of the war, the first couple, three months, uh, they may have been uh, leaning more on the side of, look, we got to go after Hamas, we realize there'll be collateral damage. And they were willing to accept uh, you know, certain potential collateral damage in order to go after certain targets. Again, I kind of go back, they had a lot more of the Gaza Strip to attack back then. So they were uh, in the middle of a larger campaign. So that also, you know, there's there's a couple things you have to consider in terms of their thinking process. But I do believe that the U.S. and others have had an impact on on what targets they go after and how they go after those targets. There was some news today about the Israeli government. Uh, Axios says that Israeli minister... Benny Gantz is expected to announce his party's withdrawal from the emergency government formed after the October 7th attack, according, according to political sources close to Gantz. How he is seen by the Biden administration as a moderate, but uh, we've also heard far-right ministers in Israel's government threaten to leave as well. I, I got to ask you, though, why might a moderate take a step back at this time? Well, Benny Gantz is very, uh, very frustrated 
with Netanyahu, very frustrated with his unwillingness uh, to engage uh, more constructively, shall we say, on some of the uh, uh, hostage release or ceasefire negotiations that have gone on. He, he probably, he seems to have uh, had some criticism, certainly of uh, how Israel's or the IDF has been uh, prosecuting the war, not so much from a, not criticizing the IDF itself, for prosecuting, they are basically frustrated with the political uh, direction that they've been given, the direction from on high uh, to them on how they're supposed to prosecute this war. That has been the essence of his uh, frustration. You have to remember, you know, he's a member of the opposition. He stepped into this and it was well received throughout Israel. Uh, after October 7th, he decided to join this war cabinet. Uh, which was, uh, we would say, bipartisan in the U.S. It's uh, not quite, uh, there's, there's, there's so many parties in, in Israel that it's not just bipartisan, it's multipartisan uh, uh, group that came in. But to say, look, this is above the political fray, this is above partisan politics, and he stepped in to do this. Now they're eight months into the war, they're at a kind of decisive point in terms of uh, which way do they go from a policy perspective, from a political perspective, uh, what he's saying is, is I, I, from, from everything I've been able to gather, he feels that his counsel is not being listened to uh, or being well cons or closely considered by uh, Netanyahu and his uh, government. I think he's also frustrated with some of the far right parties and the influence they have in that administration. So he's gonna step out. Now, will that cause the government to fall? Well, that in and of itself, as near as I can figure out, won't cause the government to fall because he wasn't part of that ruling coalition that was in power under Netanyahu to begin with. However, it, it does it does cause some issues for Netanyahu. It, it hurts him. Um, it's difficult to say, you know, that he has the broad support of uh, the government of the Knesset when, in fact, he has a cabinet that you know one of the major opposition leaders, someone who uh, uh, was at one point getting about half the public, uh, about half the voters in Israel thought he should be the prime minister. Uh, this is after October 7th. When someone like that walks away, uh, that does diminish the amount of political clout, uh, the gravitas, if you will, that Netanyahu has when he makes uh, decisions. And then, of course, the far right side. You know, he's got those uh, uh, very pro settler, if you will, um, the far right um, cabinet members, a couple of ministers in, in particular, who have been very vocal about some very extreme positions about uh, expelling Palestinians out of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And let's just say they're on the extreme spectrum, but they're still part of the cabinet. I think that's part of his frustration too, is that Netanyahu has not publicly muzzled them, uh, if you will. Also, I'm, I'm, it's, it's pretty clear that, that uh, he's frustrated with the, uh, the lack of action by the government in terms of dealing with uh, settler violence in the West Bank. And, and certainly, um, you know, we've all seen the attacks on the convoys, the eight convoys coming from Jordan uh, by settlers, by uh, far right members uh, going after them. These are all points where uh, Benny Gantz is, a, is clearly uh, frustrated with the Netanyahu administration. So I want to ask you a little bit more about the pressure that Netanyahu is under. Political put out a piece yesterday describing how Biden's administration is putting more pressure than ever on the Israeli government to bring the war to an end. Uh, of course, Hal, the pressure campaign is also aimed at Hamas, but the U.S. has more power to directly influence Israel. Uh, it feels like you and I, over the past few months, uh, have been in an endless cycle of watching and waiting for something to give, uh, for a deal to come through. Uh, d does something eventually have to give, or, or does it feel very possible that Israel continues on with its campaign without any sort of pause? Well, right now, it looks, there's there's a couple of things going. Number one, they have the uh, campaign. <clears throat> they have opened up uh, a few, I think there's another uh, a big operation uh, further north in the Gaza Strip going after areas. Uh, I'm pretty sure those are areas that were not completely cleared the first time. That seems to be what we see is they went through, moved through a lot of terrain. In some cases, they bypassed uh, neighborhoods or, or areas, urban areas. Instead of going in and clearing them out house by house, they said, look, let's just keep moving south. Let's take the rest of Gaza Strip. 
they bypassed these areas, but that the Hamas fighters that were there didn't disappear. They just went to ground, literally, and uh, pop up later. So now they're having to go through and, and clean up some of these areas that they had not uh, completely cleared the first time. <clears throat> so that's going on. You still have the, the offensive in Rafa, uh, taking out those last uh, couple of battalions, Hamas battalions, which will probably be transitioning to insurgent elements or insurgent forces fairly soon if they haven't already. I, I don't imagine they're, they're gonna be maintaining a, a uh, strong defense, if you will, in a traditional military manner for too much longer. The, the other thing though is you go up north and the winds of war are definitely blowing across the uh, uh, Israel-Lebanon border. And there's a lot of back and forth up there. There's a lot of momentum in Israel uh, politically to do something about Hezbollah, to take action on Hezbollah. And, uh, and certainly if you listen to what uh, Netanyahu has been saying, and others around him, it sounds like there's a lot of momentum to, to deal with Hezbollah. Of course, Hezbollah uh, appears to have, it's not quite clear because of where the source comes from, but appears to have taken out uh, one of the Iron Dome batteries or part of an Iron Dome battery uh, up in Northern Israel. And uh, that is an escalation. That is taking it up a little bit, uh, certainly from what they have been doing, but, uh, but it's a constant back and forth up there uh, and uh, as things are kind of wrapping up in Gaza, and this has been discussed for months, that as the Hamas situation in Gaza uh, would start to conclude or start to significantly reduce uh, in terms of its total requirements to continue operations there, that the Israeli Defense Forces would then be able to shift more forces up north to deal with the threat from Hezbollah. and. And then the other side is the political side, I should mention that uh, you know Netanyahu is facing uh, charges in court. There's a very good chance that he could be convicted of those, that he could be sentenced to prison, jail, if you will. Uh, and the longer he stays in office, the more statute of limitations on some of those charges uh, pass. And so he has a real incentive to stay in office as long as he can to uh, reduce the number of charges that could be brought against him in a, in a court. As long as he's a prime minister, uh, they can't take him to court. They can't They can't prosecute him. The moment he steps out of office, they can. So I, I have somewhere, I imagine he's got either in a desk drawer or somewhere hidden a calendar that's got the dates marked on when various charges um, are, you know, basically they hit their statute of limitations. And I'm sure that that's part of his calculus in terms of what he's looking at. All right, Hal. We'll leave it there for now. Take care as always. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks, Austin.